Thank you. Hi, everyone. And even my title for this uh, talk is uh, generated with uh, LLM. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, MLOps and how we can use the traditional MLOps for our large language model application. So these days we are hearing a lot about uh, generative AI, large language models. Uh, we have been asked uh, if this is like a um, hype. Uh, is this hype is real? Is this uh, a new iPhone? time, for example, or uh, some CEO and CTOs, they are asking how we can use LLMs to uh, still be competitive in our uh, field. And data engineers may ask how we can use that in, on our data as soon as possible. So uh, consider that you have a cool LLM application, like a chatbot that you uh, trained on your data. And this is in POC, uh, proof of concept, and you want to deploy that in production. So today I'm going to uh, mention some challenges or some uh, best practices that can help you to have your uh, M uh, LLM application to production. Uh, I am Eli Golami, a solution architect at Databricks. Uh, by that, I spend time helping my customers to uh, design, deploy, or build AI and uh, data platforms uh, for themselves and uh, applications. And uh, with a, a variety of WA customers that we have with my colleagues, Adrian uh, standing over there, uh, we are uh, helping our customers in different use cases from mining and resources to uh, energy or financial and insurance. Before my time at Databricks, uh, I spend my time in uh, different companies, academia and startup space, uh, work as a machine learning engineer and a data scientist. And technically I'm on maternity leave now. I'm a full-time mom and um, uh, last night I couldn't sleep like Josh and because she's te teething these days and uh, I couldn't have energy drink because I won't have a baby, energetic baby after nursing her. <laughs> so you may find me napping uh, next to you somewhere during after lunch uh, sessions. Okay, so uh, there is like two parts in today's session, MLOps and uh, LLMOps. So I will uh, introduce uh, what, uh, MLOps, different components, and uh, like the guidelines and what different people and roles may involve. Uh, the best practices that we use from software engineering lifecycle and the reference architecture. And from that one, uh, I'm going to explain what we can use from traditional MLOps for large language models and what concerns we need to assess. Okay, what is MLOps? Um, when we, uh, AI and machine learning applications are critical, for uh, b businesses, and on the other hand, more than 85% of uh, ML application never end up in production. So it's important to have a proper uh, ML up, uh, MLOps process. With MLOps, we have two main goals. Uh, it can be like maintaining the performance, like uh, KPIs, like uh, accuracy of the model, and we want to reduce any like uh, risk of deploying new models or code, uh, reducing the errors that we may receive when we are uh, moving our code from like dev uh, to production. And we also want to maintain a long-term efficiency. And we can see the uh, popularity of MLOp, uh, MLOps uh, term uh, was going up until we had LLM and then it changed the MLOps uh, popularity word. Okay, so uh, what is MLOps? MLOps is a set of processes and automation for managing code, data, and models to improve performance, stability, and long-term efficiency of machine learning systems. What does it mean? In other words, MLOps is a combination of DevOps, data ops, and model ops and every single of them have their own ecosystems. 
having a machine learning application in production is complex and it's not just with technology. We have different people and roles that are involved to have a successful machine learning project in production. So uh, it can be from business stakeholders, data engineers, and machine learning engineer and uh, governance. So um, in ideal case, we may have different roles for different tasks uh, that we may have during a machine learning life cycle. So when we have a project, we start with data preparation, where we may do model training or fine tuning and deploy it in production and monitoring that. Uh, I remember uh, when I was working at the startup, I was using different hats and I was doing like many of these tax, uh, tasks myself and I was uh, deploying um, the model that I've trained on uh, mobile devices myself and I was testing them. So uh, in ideal case with the big uh, teams and projects, we may have different people that doing this so having a collaborative a collaborative environment can help the uh, ml project to successfully uh, deploy in production okay so uh, uh, i really like the um, talk that uh, chad had in the morning and it was like when we are working uh, we are using machine learning models it's all about data and when we have like garbage in, we, we, we will have garbage out. So when you are thinking about any platform or eco ecosystem that you want to have for your ML use cases in your organization, it, uh, it's important to uh, decide on a data-centric machine learning platform. It can be in any cloud or any tool that you can use. It's more uh, uh, like with Databricks, all of them are under the same roof. So you can do the data ops with Delta Lake, which is an open, uh, which is open source. Uh, model ops with MLflow, which is another uh, successful open source project. And you can have DevOps with GitHub, GitLab, or Azure DevOps. You can use different tools. Uh, for this uh, uh, goal, it's important to uh, first make sure that your environment is collaborative because many people and roles are involved and uh, it is a data-centric uh, platform that helps you to have successful uh, ML projects in uh, production. Okay, so what is the fundamental of uh, MLOps? That uh, we borrow some of the items from the software best practices uh, lifecycle. So uh, for any ML workflow asset, we have code, data, and models. And all of them are important. For uh, working on them and like uh, uh, develop them, uh, every single of uh, them needs to be deployed, tested and uh, developed, tested and deployed. So uh, with a traditional software life, uh, life cycle, it's more about code and how we uh, develop that, test it and um, push that to production. With ML projects, we not only have the code, we have data that we are using to train our model and the model itself with its artifacts that uh, needs to be used. So uh, to have an executive environment around these assets, uh, we may use like a dev, staging and uh, prod uh, environment uh, for doing that. You, in your organization, you may have only two or more than four. Uh, it's more, uh, it's the concept here is important to have isolated environment for different purposes for your machine learning uh, application. So uh, when we are moving from dev to uh, production, uh, it's more about like the data that we have in uh, dev it can be like a test data set. And when we go to, uh, to production, it's more uh, serious data that uh, not everyone has access to that. So it's more like from open to lockdown environment and uh, uh, low data quality to high data quality. 
uh, you, uh, with Databricks, you can have uh, different uh, approaches to isolate this environment. First, you can have different environment on different clouds like Azure, AWS, and GCP. Or when, uh, with one uh, Databricks account on uh, one cloud provider, you can define different workspaces for each uh, environment. Or with one workspace, uh, with uh, uh, like assigning data access uh, correctly, you can uh, have this. You can simulate this uh, in different environments within one workspace. We recommend the middle one for. Uh, having a better like isolation for data and code and models. Okay, so uh, with, um, within um, machine learning projects, the life cycle that we have for code are different from the models. So what does it mean? It means that one of them can go to the next stage faster than the other one. Uh, for example, when we have like a a weekly fraud detection model, you may, uh, if we, every week, you may, based on the data that you have, you may retrain your model and then deploy that for, to on production uh, like for next week. So it means that your training code and like pre-processing and post-processing code is not changing as frequently as the model. On the other hand, for computer vision models and large language models that it's really expensive to train a model, uh, you may consider to train that like a couple of times a year and then you may work with the code and like uh, monitoring code and stuff. So here it means that uh, the code in the life cycle is uh, changing more frequently than the model. So with this one, uh, we may have two different uh, pa patterns to deploy our uh, machine learning projects. Uh, one can be with the code and data that you have in your dev environment. You may generate the model and move the model with its artifacts to the staging and production. The other, uh, with this approach, if uh, you change the code, uh, you, it's tricky to uh, test the uh, changed code, for example, in the staging environment. The other approach that we recommend is uh, deploying code as we go from dev to production. In dev environment, you can generate the model with the data, uh, test data, for example, that you have and then move that to staging, test the code, generate a sample model, and then with, in the production, train your model with production data. How does it work? The second approach would be like in the dev environment, you, uh, the, a data scientist can have like the training code, uh, any other code that uh, you may need to generate uh, uh, a model. It can be in like any fine tuning or uh, pre-processing uh, in dev environment. And the good thing is that it can work on a sample data set. And when we are happy with that, we promote code to the staging. And in the staging environment, the model training uh, tests only on the subset of data. And we can check the uh, codes not only uh, it, in the code itself, we can test that end to end with the other like uh, codes and scripts that we have in our pipeline. And when we release our version to production, then we can train our model on the production data. So if our data scientists, for example, in dev environment, they don't have access to the uh, high quality and restricted data in production because the training uh, code is already tested. So we can have more automated uh, way to train our model on production data test our model and if the new model has a better accuracy and performance than the current one in production, we can replace that and uh, have our monitoring stuff in production as well. So by explaining how uh, our code life cycle can be different from our model life cycle, this is the reference architecture. 
uh, that very common and it's uh, uh, when we apply that it uh, makes sure that any changes within our machine learning project is reliable and it is using like a software engineering best practices for CI CD as well. So if I want to go through each section, so with the uh, dev environment, we may have the model training, we uh, may explore the data to understand our uh, problem better, and we create a new dev branch from here, and when we push that to, uh, when we push that to uh, staging, on the top uh, layer, we have our uh, git provider, so uh, it can be like uh, GitHub or uh, Bitbucket. So in the dev branch, when you request uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, request a merge, then uh, we go to the and the layer, uh, the bottom layer is the uh, data layer that it is like a shareable data, one single source of data that uh, we manage the access by access control. And uh, when uh, our code is, uh, uh, is going to the staging uh, environment, then we run the unit tests and the code uh, testing it like by itself and in the whole pipeline of the uh, environment that we have. And it would be beneficial if we could have a um, very similar pipeline with the production environment. And uh, we are training our model on a subset of data, so it won't take time. And when uh, we are happy and there is no, uh, uh, nothing wrong here, uh, it triggers uh, the release, uh, branch and it goes to production and with production it is like the uh, refreshed uh, feature table and the uh, model training uh, it also because it is training on the production data uh, it, it is like it's training over there and with ml flow we, we you can have different versions of the model deployed in the uh, uh, model registry and with, with the monitoring uh, apis you can check if the accuracy is better you can deploy that and you have all the flexibilities here so uh, what about when we have large language models applications how these uh, new, uh, uh, new models can change our traditional MLOP lifecycle. So uh, here, there is some parts. Uh, the first one is the model training, because uh, model training is more expensive than the tradition uh, mod uh, with large language models and computer vision, for example, compared to the traditional machine learning models. So you may have like fine, fine tuning or uh, prompt engineering here instead of generating a model every time in your dev environment. The other difference that we may have is, oh, sorry, the other difference that we may have is the human feedback, which is really critical, uh, critical uh, to have in our large language models applications. Because, uh, uh, in the traditional ML, we, uh, we may be able to have automated monitoring tools to uh, detect like model drifting or data drifting. With large language models, it's important to have user feedbacks and it can be collected from different resources, internal resources or external resources. And um, we, uh, we need to consider that as um, like a valuable data set that we can fine tune our model based on that. Uh, and the other item is the continuous deployment based on the changes that we have and the feedback that we receive from uh, human evaluation, which is different from traditional uh, MLOps. And the other thing is the tooling that we have. So you may need to use GPUs instead of CPUs for uh, LLMs and uh, inference time or cost 
for running LLMs can be different and more expensive than the traditional one. So, uh, in general, yeah, and uh, it emphasizes the cost that we would have. Uh, and when, for example, you want to compare uh, uh, fine-tuned models that you had with uh, third-party API, which is avail available for you to use. So it is uh, another important factor that we need to consider when we are deploying our LLM project to production. So uh, in general, the overall approach is the same having different uh, stages uh, the, for our environment, having isolated data versions and deploying code and models uh, when needed. The uh, main concerns that we may have for the LLM ops, which is different from uh, ML ops, are about like, for example, prompt engineering. Prompt engineering, you may consider that as part of the ML side of the project and there is some concepts uh, for example when you want to move your project from dev to staging and production uh, so uh, it, it considered as LLMs, uh, LLM ops and I'm going uh, through uh, every single of this item here so uh, the prompt engineering is, uh, what is a prompt? A prompt is an input or query that we have for our large language models to receive response. So for uh, prompt engineering, we want to be able to uh, track them, template them and automate them. For tracking our prompts, uh, one of the tools that uh, has uh, natively support for large language models is uh, MLflow and you can uh, track your queries and responses and compare them in future in, if needed. And for having an, a standardized way to uh, do this like prompt engineering, there is some tools like Langchain and uh, 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 Llama Index that you can use for templating these uh, prompts. And for automating them to get rid of the manual prompt engineering, uh, you may use a DSP as, um, uh, as, a, a, as an example tool. So you can replace the manual prompt engineering. Uh, if you are not familiar with that, we can consider that as hyperparameter tuning when you have a data-driven approach to find the best uh, uh, hyperparameter for a project, for example. We, uh, this is like the same concept. Still, uh, it may uh, consider as a complex hyperparameter, but we, we can consider that as a hyperparameter uh, tuning as well. Uh, within an uh, LLM project, uh, it doesn't matter if we use like the model API or we fine tune the model or we use like different frameworks. We want to be able to uh, deploy the model and make it ready for production. And we don't want our data engineers or the other uh, roles that are involved to be uh, worried about the uh, libraries or dependencies or anything that we need to run this model. So for uh, packaging that, uh, MLflow has uh, API to support that and it can support uh, all different uh, methods to uh, package the models or pipelines to be able to de uh, deploy that in production. If you are not familiar with MLflow, MLflow is an open source uh, platform that can help you to uh, track and monitor your models. Uh, so uh, within a project, uh, I don't think uh, anyone uh, use the first, uh, very first model that generate for a project and deploy that in production. We usually have variety of them with different like parameters and metrics. And with MLflow, it automatically uh, save the metrics and parameters for you and you can deploy that in like a uh, model registry um, and uh, deploy that in production. So this is like a way that um, it can help you to manage your uh, ML lifecycle. 
So uh, the other uh, challenge is the uh, compute that we need for LLM uh, projects. So you may use the distributed ways to, uh, for fine tuning or for inference uh, for saving cost and uh, performance time. And uh, the other uh, thing that you may consider when you want to move your uh, LLM project to um, production is to uh, is optimization. It can be like a cost of queries. It can be like the uh, accuracy. Uh, accuracy and other metrics are the same with the traditional ML. And uh, so the human feedback is the most important part here. And when you are focusing on optimizing, uh, you, you don't need to overthinking that because this is like an ever-changing field and you may find different ways to do that in six months times from now. And uh, yeah, the human feedback, which is really important because uh, I'm going to the end. Uh, this is uh, the last slide that I like to explain that uh, when I was talking about different deploy, deploy models, so uh, where for the second approach that we deploy our code to staging and production and regenerate models, you may, uh, for your LLM projects, you may reconsider that based on different project and use cases. It can be expensive, so uh, you can consider like having different uh, like service architecture instead of um, retraining the whole model, have the vector database or uh, the vector database as a different services, then you can move your um, APIs uh, rather than the whole model. So it was, uh, I uh, came to the end and this is the resources that uh, I used and happy to answer uh, any question. Thank you.